one location. We have our oil sketch. I certainly didn't go to any trouble. Didn't get very much detail down with this oil sketch. The sky, I've only just used it to cut in the shape of that distant headland. All I'm really interested in doing is writing myself notes, getting the feel of it, making some colours, and together with the photographs which I've now got back, here they are, we can now quietly set about our task of creating the illusion of that particular scene. The difference is we don't have the problems that are normally associated on location. Now I've already mixed up some colours here. What I like to do is to use one of these colours to draw the painting up. The distant colour which appears in the far distant headland, I use that colour to draw it up. And the reason for that is very clear. If I leave some of that colour after I have finished painting, it doesn't matter. But if it was a pencil line, if it was a dark line, I've then got to cover it, and it's exactly the same problem as I had with the white paint, the white canvas. So I therefore mix up a colour which I'm going to need anyway, and I use that to draw it up. I use plenty of medium in it, and I just draw it up with a very fine brush. Just writing myself notes still at this stage. All I'm interested in is the general feeling in the shape. There's trees as they come down on that headland there. Nice beach going across here. Have a reflection underneath there. Now for all intents and purposes, that's all I really need to worry about for drawing it up. Now taking that same colour, I'm going to start in the back distance there. Now, immediately the problem which comes to me in my mind is the problem of aerial perspective. Now, aerial perspective I would rather call colour perspective. That's what happens to colour as it comes towards you. As colour comes towards you, it is getting darker. It's caused by the atmosphere. In that particular scene, there was lots and lots of atmosphere anyway, early in the morning. Now, as that colour gets closer and closer to me, it's got to get darker and darker. It gets more and more contrast and more and more detail and darker and darker. In actual fact, what is happening, your eye doesn't really do the seeing. What really happens is that your eye takes a message to your brain and your brain will then compare that message with a whole lot of memories and a whole lot of experiences which you've stored up in your childhood and it'll let you see exactly what it thinks you should be seeing. And that can create optical illusions in a painting because people will look at that painting and a road will stand up because you haven't allowed for aerial perspective. There are a lot of problems, but in actual fact, problems can be looked in two ways. They're either a problem or they're an opportunity. And if you want to exaggerate aerial perspective, there are some exciting opportunities. So what I'm doing, I've mixed up that colour by just adding more of the pigment colour that is, I started off with a mixture of white, cerulean, and alizarin crimson. I have just added more of the cerulean and alizarin crimson, and I have got a darker version. In other words, what I've really done is just taken out the white. And I'm going to brush that into that headland there. I'm not interested in the shape along the top as it meets the sky because just as I did with the oil sketch, I can cut in later on with that sky colour. Now blend that along so that one colour goes into the other. 
Now that headland is gently moving towards us. It's also moving away from the light, so it's another reason why it has to get darker. And as I'm going, I'm putting in the reflection. Now I'm keeping the paint fairly thin because I know I'm going to have to go back over this later on. So it's a waste of time putting it on thick and I only wind up puddling in it later. Now there's no detail. I'm finishing off with vertical brush strokes and very thin paint. With this underpainting pinky colour or brownie colour can actually show through and it actually adds to it quite nicely. It gives it a nice glowing look. The next row of trees through here is going to go slightly darker. I've added more of the pigment colours again and I've added a wee bit of ultramarine blue just to try and bring it down in value just a little bit. And that is going in through there. Now I'm going to do exactly the same thing again. Take that same colour and I'm going to put more ultramarine blue and more lizard and crimson into it and darken it down even further. When you start getting a lot of a strong pigment colour like ultramarine blue, you have to be careful because the colour becomes so strong that it becomes unbelievable. It's at a time like that when an earth colour such as burnt sienna added to it can just dirty it up just a little bit and makes it more believable. Now I'm trying to bring that down in value so that it is a darker version of the previous colour. I can now start with this front headland. As I get an area where two wet layers of paint are touching, I'm trying very hard not to overdo it and I want, if possible, leave it. This style of painting is called ala prima, or one stroke. What we're trying to do is wherever we possible, wherever we put that brush on the canvas, wherever possible we want to not have to touch it again. So when it, I'm actually putting, especially in an area like this, where there's two wet layers together, I want to try and not have to touch that again if I can help it. So get the shape of that headland fairly right. finish it off again with vertical brush strokes. Remember it's a very atmospheric painting. It's still going on quite thin, lots of medium. Scrub it in and then finish it off with vertical brush strokes. Now we have a reflection underneath that and it's a slightly greener version of the colour that's actually in that headland. So I'm going to take that colour I've just been using, I'm going to mix some chrome green oxide into it and that will suffice. for our reflection. What I like to see in a painting like this is where the two colours blend together. Sometimes it's hard to see where the reflection starts and that can be quite fun.
tend to clean the brush fairly often so that I don't get one paint going into the other, cleaning it out on a rag. While I'm on that subject, rather than using a rag, I would suggest anything like the yellow pages, books which can be actually ripped out leaving a binding is far better than a rag because with a rag you tend to wind up wiping your brush in part of the rag which has already been used and it gets absolutely everywhere. With this you can simply turn a page and it's much more tidy. The rag then is just to get the terps off. Now then, what we're going to do now is try and put some subtle detail into that headland there. I don't want to put in too much, but I want to just suggest some detail. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this colour here, which is ni nice and high in value, and I'm going to just tint it slightly with some yellow ochre and put it through there. What I've actually done is I've isolated three little piles and I've tinted them with varying amounts of the earth colours. That is to say, burnt sienna, yellow ochre. To just recap on that, I've taken this colour here. Now you can see that's quite light in value. I've taken that colour and I've isolated three little piles and I have put yellow ochre into one I put burnt sienna into another, and I put a bit more burnt sienna into another one. Now, what I mean by light and value, there are, there are two main things that make a colour. One is its value, and the other is its hue. Its hue, of course, is the actual colour, the spectrum from cold to hot. Its value is very, very important. The value is the difference between that colour and that colour, if it was being reproduced in a black and white photograph. What grade of black to white is that colour? Quite obviously that colour is darker in value than that one. So I have chosen a lighter value colour to tint because I want to show the half lights in this area, but I want this, these colours to be a close cousin to this colour because this is the atmospheric colour. I want them all to bind together. So I've used that colour as the base and I've tinted it. That way the whole painting holds together and the atmospheric colour is over the whole painting. So having said that, I can now proceed. I don't want to go to too much detail. That bank through there Very interesting. I'm creating patterns here. It's all I'm really doing, which is creating an illusion. All I'm interested in is the patterns. Now I can get that out of the brush. Now it's time that I addressed also the shape of these trees. I've taken again that same colour and I'm going to cut into this front colour and create the trees. See this colour I have on the brush here that I previously placed in here, the same colour I'm just going to cut holes. If you like use a smaller brush if you prefer.
Now, this method of cutting holes works very well as long as you realise that whatever it is you're going to be cutting the holes with must be the colour which appears behind the object. So as I move along and that colour which is behind is changing, I therefore must change the colour that I'm cutting the holes with. It's the opposite to what normal person, in inverted commas, as artists are never normal, would, do, would paint a picture. What I'm interested in is not so much the, sh the fact that it's a tree with a trunk and leaves, but I'm interested in the gap left by the tree in the distant hills. I'm more interested in the shape left in that distant headland by this tree or group of trees. You can modify it later, of course. I want to just complete that reflection a little bit. Now, of course, I can go back over it later and tidy it up a little bit more. We must make sure that it's interesting. We must make sure that it's not monotonous. We can place some of the darker colour on top again if you've overdone it in an area. Now then, we've put in those trees we can now look at placing this nice blue area where the beach goes into shadow. And in exactly the same way, I'm going to be cutting holes with that lighter colour. What I'm looking for is patterns and contrasts. As this nice cold blue of the sand goes into shadow, you, on the actual sketch that we did, you can see it going in here. I put it in there to remind myself I'm going to use that blue colour to cut holes in here in exactly the same way as I cut holes in up there to give me the illusion of trees. You'll find me using this term cutting holes quite often. For simplicity's sake, it's much easier to teach you to mix a colour if we're starting off from exactly the same one. I mixed up heaps when I first started. I'm going to put white in it, and I'm going to put more cerulean in it. So it's going to give me a lighter and a bluer version of that colour. Rule of thumb with colour mixing is to put a little bit in at a time. Often I found that I mix it up, and before I know where I am, I've, I've got a whole bucket full and really I only needed a thimble full. So if you just put a little wee bit in at a time, you just keep mixing it until it, all the streaks are out. It's not streaky, just like mixing the cake at home. I'm looking for two components in, in this colour. I'm trying to get the right value of colour and the right hue of colour. I can mix it up, compare it with my photograph, compare it with my oil sketch. Once I've got it, away I go. Now, through here, That colour can be darkened up to bring it forward. In the interests of oil, of aerial perspective, we must darken it up. That same colour as it appears a good three, four hundred yards closer to me has got to be darker. So I'm just adding more of the pigment, which is, in this case, cerulean blue. In it goes. Now, where I'm getting 
this colour going over the top of the other colour, I've got to be very, very careful. I put the original colour on thinly, as you may remember. The reason I did that is because I knew I'd be coming back over it later. You cannot put fat paint onto fat paint. So to that degree, you've got to plan it. If you know you're going to come back into it later, you have to put thin paint on. That's plenty of medium. Keep the paint thin. If you're putting another colour, especially a lighter colour, which is very easy to get dirty, on top, you have to make sure that it's actually thicker. So this colour is slightly thicker, and I can cut holes in it. Because it's thicker, it's going on. It dirties up my brush, so I can wipe it on my bit of paper, make sure that I preserve a clean brush. I got the, don't get very many swipes with the brush, and it's too dirty, and I've got to actually give it another clean. As I'm going through here, what I'm interested in is just creating shapes. I don't want to be boring. The actual shape where that beach touches those rocks is most important. Mustn't be boring. actually just soften the edge up just a little bit. Now then, just to make sure that you've got it nice and interesting and you haven't overdone it, you can actually place the odd other shape going into that by taking this colour here, putting it on fairly thick, just place the odd one here and there to just break up that pattern. Now don't get into the habit of putting the same tired old shape. If you find one shape that's nice, three of them are not three times nicer, you've got to make sure that you add variety to it. Now then, I've mixed up a dark colour. What I have done is I have taken this colour and I have added ultramarine blue and viridian to it. Um, and I have actually arrived at a colour which is quite a lot darker. Mostly ultramarine blue, there's very little else that I added to it. And I've got a colour which is quite an attractive colour, which is just the rocks appearing down through here. Now as I get up through here, I've added alizarin crimson to it to warm it up. And it just gives a little bit of variety here and there. Now, we're just going to be creating shapes with this. I'm loath to take a small brush because if I do, I invariably start puddling with it. If I keep with a, a big brush, it's very difficult to make that mistake. So I tend to persevere with a brush which feels too big for me. If it feels slightly too big, it's probably the right brush. Just putting in the absolute darks here, where the light's not getting at all. I'm making suggestions for what I'm doing. Try and remember that this type of painting is actually Impressionism. So what we're trying to do is just create suggestions. I suppose if you were to compare it with other art forms, such as, say, writing a book, you could say that if you were going to 
reproduce a photograph or a painting in its absolute detail, you would be comparing it to maybe writing a novel. Whereas with Impressionism, I'm only creating an impression. I'm trying to put down as little detail as I can that will trigger responses in your subconscious. Memories, things that you've got stored away, and your brain will actually let you see things that you haven't actually seen, but I've just suggested them. And that's called Impressionism. And that, in the simile again of writing the book, that is like writing a poem. What I'm trying to do is to write you the book with as few words as possible. So I bear that in mind when I'm doing my painting, that I keep it as brief as possible, and I just write you a poem. Now, we haven't put on any highlights at all as yet. So far, all we've done is half tones and shadows. And the fun will start when we start putting on the highlights. Don't fall into the trap of finishing an area of a painting. You must let the whole painting move towards completion together. It's got to go through an ugly stage. If you don't allow it to go through that ugly stage, the stage where you really do do a lot of worrying about it, uh, then it's just not going to come right. So let's push on. These colours that I put up through here, I really ought to look at reflecting them. So I'm going to mix them into my reflection colour. That's fairly simple. Just take a piece of my reflection colour and I'm going to mix those colours into it. I think that little brush is a little small for my purposes. There's lots of other details in that bank that are crying out for me to put, be put in, but I'm loath to because I want to keep it simple. I want now to just put in what is going to be the highlight in the distance there. Because there's so much atmosphere, the highlights were being affected by this misty atmosphere, and the highlights really weren't very strong. So I'm going to take this colour and I'm just going to add white to it. And because the sun is warm, I'm just going to warm it up. I want to lift it in value slightly and I want to warm it. What is happening is that the sun is striking it, which is lightening it and warming it. So just take that colour and lighten it and warm it. There's that colour. I'm just taking it, I'm adding it in warm up with just a smidgen of the, maybe the cadmium red. We'll just see what it looks like. Yes, that's warming it up just a little bit at a time. Now the sun is just striking the tops of those trees there in the distance. I tend to, when they're that far back, I tend to put them on with a palette knife like this. That stops me from putting on individual trees and I just tend to put on the overall impression. Well, I've, while I've got it, I must remember to reflect that colour. All right then, now that we've placed the highlights through here, we'll look at the highlights on this forward bluff. Remembering that this is much closer, there's less atmosphere between my eyes and what I'm seeing, so the highlight is going to be much more contrasty. It's going to be less affected by that atmospheric colour. Nevertheless, we'll start off with that atmospheric colour, which is a blue. We'll add yellow to it. And of course, blue and yellow gives you green. 
uh, and yellow ochre, which very much helps to give that colour a believable look. Often what happens is that a, a colour can get so strong in pigment that it's just not believable. So an earth colour added to it can really help. Burnt sienna or yellow ochre, very good like that. Makes the colour quite believable by dirtying it up a little bit. I compare that with what I've got my sketch and my photograph, compare it with what I've got up there. I'd like to actually mix up several different variations of highlight because remembering it's in the front now and it's close to us so we can see a lot more detail. We're going to see a lot more than what we saw in the distant headland. So two or three different variations, different kinds of trees would be quite interesting. So I might take an, uh, another colour that is maybe a bit darker in value and use that as a base. Maybe one of the darker colours through here, which I've preserved. I always keep some aside. And I'll tint that in exactly the same way. With some yellow. Some yellow ochre. This time maybe a little bit of burnt sienna to it. More. Now we'll see what that looks like. The rule of thumb with oil colours is to always put your darks on first. Very seldom is that ever broken. 